but it seems to this week, Elder, that at this state of the art, this is a good time to have a maximum number to make the potential a bit more difficult thing to knock out. The fine, General Ritman, thank you for this picture of the Air Force Ballistic Missile Division. And Andre, let us turn to the civilian side. And the contractors concerned also with the problem. We're here at the astronautic plant of the Convair Division of General Dynamics Corporation. And I think you know a vice president of Convair, Tom Lansing. I do indeed. Good morning, Tom. Good morning, David. That is quite a display around you there. Indeed it is, David. Impressive. And when you think of the awful thing that goes on the nose here, it's awesome. This line represents 10 years of effort on behalf of the people of Convair and North America and other people in the industry working for the Air Force to develop uh, another and hopefully timely uh, deterrent weapon for the free world. Each of these cylinders has a double purpose, actually. They can be used as weapons or they can be used as space vehicles. For instance, off this line and right out of this building will come the booster that will put the first American in space, not necessarily the first human, but the first American. Uh, the majority of these, however, will be used for test testing and also as, uh, as weapons in the deterrent force. Tom, Russia is going to have more weapons than we are pretty shortly, according to Secretary McElroy. Are you going to be content and comfortable with Russia having more weapons than we do? No, I'm afraid not. I don't think any thinking man should. These, uh, these weapons, if we have enough of them, if we have them in time, and of the appropriate quality, and I'm quite certain the industry can, uh, can, afford, can, uh, can afford the quality for the government. The government, of course, has to ask for the numbers and has to ask for them in time. If you have enough of them in time with the right quality to meet the threat, uh, I wouldn't be concerned. But I'm afraid at the moment the government isn't asking for enough of them and isn't going to have them in time. There's one other element of a deterrent weapon system such as these, and that is the policy into which it's integrated. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about the brutish uh, brandishing that Khrushchev does with his missiles over at Suez, or, uh, or as he's doing now as a backdrop for his pressures on Berlin. But I do believe that, A, we ought to have enough of these things, we ought to have them in time, and that the Soviets ought to be acquainted with the power we have when we have it, and this ought to thoroughly understand the circumstances under which uh, we might use, have to use them in our defense. Can you produce them in time if you're given a go-ahead by the administration? We could produce twice as many as they're currently going to be asked to by 1961. Our associates and ourselves agree in this. However, they have to ask us to go ahead right now to get that done. Let me get that again, Tom. You could produce twice as many weapons as you're going to produce? That's right. You got it right. You don't think any of are very well organized? Uh, Convair does business with all seven agencies in the government that concerns itself with space. Uh, the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, uh, Mr. Holliday, Mr. Johnson's office, Harper, Dr. York in, in the Pentagon, and Dr. Glennon. All seven of these men and their agencies are people with conscientious and vigorous folks who are currently shifting out their responsibilities in the space, space program and who are, of course, them to get what they can of the dollars in the uh, limited space budget. I would say uh, the answer to your question probably uh, will come from this very program. I suppose that uh, some representative or spokesman from each one of these seven agencies is on this program, yes. and if any single one of them has or will or does give you a comprehensive statement of what our space program is, and it can assure you that there is going to be adequate funding to support that program, I would imagine you have your answer. I hope some individual does, has or does give you that answer. I suspect he won't be able to. Thank you, Tom. We hear you plainly. Tom Lanthier from the Condor Astronautics Plant in San Diego at the assembly line production for Atlas Missiles. We switch back to today in New York. Keep listening for that answer that Tom asked that you listen for. See if you get it. In a few minutes, we will meet the man most frequently described as the first philosopher of space as we examine the question of space where we stand. This is today on NBC.
missiles and an outer space development. It becomes the first big battle of the new 86th Congress. The first major hearings began last week. An investigation by the Senate Preparedness Subcommittee and the Senate Outer Space Committee. These hearings will continue this week. They promise to make additional headlines. We switch now to Peter Hassett with NBC Washington and two key members of the Senate investigating group. Senator Stuart Simonson, Democrat of Missouri, who says we are far behind the Russians in long-range missiles, and charges the administration's new military budget and dangers to the security of our country, and Republican Senator Leverett Saltstall of Massachusetts, who defends the president's new military budget, saying we don't have to match Russian missiles for missiles, so long as we have the balance, strength, force, and all weapons. This morning, though, we hope to listen to these gentlemen to probe these consistent points of view. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Dave. We have what I think are some pretty probing questions for these two senators this morning. We'll start with Senator Simonson. Senator is a former Air Force Secretary and a longtime member of the Senate Armed Services Committee. What's your view of where the nation stands today? Just how well prepared are we to defend ourselves? Last week, this administration at long last admitted that it was voluntarily passing over Superiority, if not supremacy, in the intercontinental ballistic missile field on the grounds that we had capacity to retaliate in other lines. Aside from the fact that capacity will be, be heavily dented from a surprise attack, we base that on three things primarily. First, our submarine retaliatory capacity, of which today we have none. <coughs> Secondly, I our high RBM capacity, which the reason can't get into this morning is rapidly being reduced in effectiveness. And finally, on the strategic air force, which the chief of staff of the air force admitted, number one, there are no planes on air alert in this country today. And number two, three quarters of that air force today, according to his voluntary statement, are obsolete. Senator Saltonstall, you're familiar with the Democratic criticism of the new military budget, I'm sure. As ranking Republican on the Armed Services Committee and its former chairman, what's your appraisal of the administration's $41 billion spending program? Well, Mr. Galloway, it's a tight budget. It's a tight spending program. But we have the uh, statement from the Secretary of Defense, Mr. McElroy, the Secretaries of the Sea Armed Services, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and the Chief of Staff, that they can get along with it. They all, in the services, want something more. That's natural, but they say they can get along with it, and I hope, as a member of the Senate, that they can and will. It's like uh, it's like the family. I raised five children. They, none of them had everything they wanted, but we all got along satisfactorily together. Senator Simonson, you said that by 1961, the Russians will have a four-to-one lead over this country in long-range missions. Secretary McElroy and the other fellows with military intelligence shows the Russians will not have ICBMs operation before we do. And whose intelligence is correct there? Well, we will have uh, We do have the knowledge today that the Russians will have ICBMs before we do. I said four to one. Uh, Mr. McElroy said three to one. Uh, in my opinion, and I've done my best to find a fact there, uh, my four to one figure is very, very conservative. Uh, Senator Saltonstall, some Pentagon officials have indicated that they would like more money for things like research and development. For example, uh, ARPH, who Floyd Johnson says he could use another $300 million. Should they get that money? Uh, can they have it without unbalancing the president's budget, or should it be unbalanced if they need to get that budget? Well, <coughs> research and development, uh, Dave, is a question of priority. There's approximately somewhere between five and six billions of dollars for research and development this year. Now that can be put uh, into uh, priorities uh, as determined by the head of the research in the Defense Department. Ms. Johnson uh, wants more uh, and, she, and can uh, sell that idea uh, on, on a priority basis, and then undoubtedly he can get more. It's a question of priorities, always. Senator Simonson, aside from this long-range missile question, are there other areas in the President's new military budget that you feel are inadequate? Oh, yes. The great inadequacy right now from the standpoint of the current danger is that whereas almost everybody unique uh, 
has an understanding that we have a lot of planes on air alert. Facts are that we haven't got a single airplane this morning on air alert. And as much as the desire of any possible enemy would be to catch our battle for a capacity on the ground, that is a very serious matter indeed. As you know, uh, Peter, the uh, many of the witnesses who came before the committee last week, members of this administration, said that they needed a great deal more money to find where they needed it and said they could have it as soon as possible. I'll go by their judgment. Senator Sheldon Stahl, whether the administration figures are correct or Senator Simonson, <coughs> that is an ICBM strength, the administration's been criticized for not telling the full defense story to the nation. Is it possible to make more facts public? Well, it's, uh, Peter, it's uh, President Eisenhower's desire to make all the facts public that can be made public. <coughs> Certainly we in Congress believe that the American public should know just as much as they can it's a question of giving them all we can uh, without sacrificing our security by giving information uh, to our possible enemies. Senator, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Simon, um, you have just startled me when you said that we have not a single plane on the alert this morning. Why have we not, sir? Because we haven't got the money, Jerry, to put them in the air. Is there money for that in the new budget? Best of my knowledge, there is not a cent. Senator Sheldon Stahl, because of a budget bureau order with which I think you are familiar, this order not to ask for increased funds, it's believed by some that some officials would be reluctant to ask Congress for money they honestly feel that the nation's defenses need. What will happen to these officials if they should disobey that order? I think Mr. Johnson already has. Well, he has, Mr. Johnson already has. Uh, I think that I know. Mr. McElroy and President Eisenhower want every official to answer their questions honestly. But that, uh, what your question really means is that in the first instance, uh, they shouldn't ask for more than what's in the budget. But if anyone like myself or Senator Simonson asks them specific questions which demand more money, then they should answer that question honestly. And if they do, why nothing will happen to them, in my opinion. Senator Simonson, do you feel there are enough votes now in Congress to force increased military spending? And if so, will it be spent the money appropriated? There's no way that we can force anybody to spend money in the administrative branch. For example, last year, after listening to the testimony, the Congress appropriated a billion three hundred million dollars <coughs> additionally in order to help our defenses against the growing menace of the communist conspiracy. Of that money, thirty-four percent was spent. 8% was spent for reasons that we did not appropriate it for, and today, day, 58% not only has not been spent, but there are no plans to spend it. That's fascinating to hear, sir. Peter? Senator Saldenstall continuing that same line of questioning. If the Congress does improve, uh, approve increased military spending as it did last year, would the President then be justified in not allowing it to be spent, as he also did last year? That's, <coughs> that's a question of degree, uh, uh, Peter. It's a question of decision by the president, uh, whether that money should be spent uh, and how it should be spent and when it should be spent. As uh, Senator Simonson has said, we appropriate the money, but the executive department has the responsibility of spending it. One quick final question to both you gentlemen. Senator Simonson, well, how much of an issue do you think this entire thing we're discussing now will be in 1960? Well, I think it's a very basic issue. In our form of government, the strength of a nation depends on the will of the people. And in a democratic form of government, our form of government, that will can only function if the people are informed. How about you, Senator Sullivan, so? I think it, it, it depends whether, whether it's an issue or not. will depend upon the security of our country at that time, how we're going ahead, and the latest intelligence report as to our possible enemies, wherever they may be. May I ask both of you gentlemen if you think the public is being sufficiently informed? I defer to my senior colleague. Well, my answer to that is that I believe that they're being informed, uh, Dave, uh, to the best of a possible degree without impairing our security. That is always a question of judgment. And you, Senator Patterson? I was very glad yesterday to see that Senate Secretary McElroy stated there had been some misinformation given us. I was also glad to see that Roy Johnson had the courage to say that although he came into our hearing with a desire to follow the party line, realizing he was under oath, he decided to tell the people the truth. Thank you very much, Senator. 
Thank you both, gentlemen. I think uh, that indicates to you, Dave, we haven't seen the end of this particular fight. Now back to today in New York. No, we haven't seen the end of it. That's pretty sure. Now you have two senatorial opinions. Certainly during recent months, there has been sufficient talk of claims and counterclaims to leave America somewhat confused over missile programs and the race in the outer space. Still, we thought we understood enough for us to get some opinions from some men, from the man in the street. We went to New York to start at Midtown at the time as we were wrapping up final preparations for this program. And the interviewer is the fellow that we've probably heard before. Let's find out what some folks think on the corner of this. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, tell me your name, please. Uh, Wisson, W-H-I-S-S-E-N. Where's your hometown, Mr. Wisson? Uh, I live up uh, near George Washington, J.C. What do you think about this guy into space? Should we go into space? I think so. Yes. 